Hey everyone, uh, Sudhansu here. And with me, uh, we have, uh, I, I can't see other panel members. Uh, I'm not sure if they are connected. Okay. Hey Pratik. So we have Pratik, we have Ritesh, um, and we have Ankit. Uh, all are like uh, the big names <laughs> in the community. Uh, and I, I don't think uh, I need to introduce any of uh, uh, them, but uh, yeah, I've learned from everyone. Uh, uh, I've, I'm very fond of everyone's work. Pratik uh, work on Preact and uh, Nexus. Um, Ritesh, uh, I've, like recently, I was using uh, one of the transform tool for the GraphQL. So, uh, like anytime uh, you think of some side project, uh, Ritesh is the first uh, point of that. And Ankit, uh, our smiley guy, uh, and uh, uh, he, he teaches. Uh, with his smile, so yeah, that, that would be uh, my points. Uh, you people want to uh, say something about yourself, Pratik? Okay, yeah, I can start. Uh, just a little bit of intro. I I'm a I'm a front end engineer at Coinbase. I'm looking after their uh, build and deploy and infrastructure. Uh, I have been working on their front end and a bunch of other organizations front end for quite some time now. Uh, have dabbled with, as you said, a few uh, frameworks and libraries that a bunch of you might have used. Um, yeah, that's that's mostly about it. Uh, Ritesh? Uh, Ritesh. Uh, so uh, I'm Ritesh. Uh, I work as a front end developer at PSPDF Kit. Uh, I I do a lot of side projects that are basically related to music or art. Uh, so yeah, that's about me. Cool. Hey everyone. I think Sudhanju just said that I have a good smile, but my code I think is uh, I think ten percent of it. So that's how beautiful my code is. And I have uh, I've been working a very long time in front end space. So I was with Flipkart for six seven years. And then I recently switched to Disney plus Hotstar as an engineering manager. So that doesn't mean that I just uh, talk about roadmaps and stuff. So I actively deep dive into architectures. And I think that's why I was selected in this, uh, not because of my smile. So, <laughs> so looking forward to having some fun talk here. Uh, although I can't see how many participants there are, if you are, uh, hello to everyone. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I have one uh, first question. Like uh, basically, there is a when we say front end architecture, uh, people have a different meaning of it. Uh, people uh, like everyone I talk about front end architecture, they start with a different point. Uh, so I'd like to start with you people. Like uh, uh, when we say front end architecture, what does it mean for you? So maybe we can start with uh, Ankit. So for me, so I have worked in very different spaces. So I've worked in e-commerce, I've worked in internal sites. I've, I'm now working on OTT platform, right? So your architecture differs with each use case. And for me, it's just a means to an end. So, so if your end is, let's say performance, uh, so then your architecture should be fast by default. You can't pick the latest thing on the shelf and then work towards it, right? That does not work in a long run in a long ended project. It's not a weekend project that you would spend one week fixing this. And then uh, it's a recurring cycle. You have, you will find re yourself re reinventing the wheel a lot of times if you don't think very clearly about it. And if you, if your uh, use case is just some forms, right? So then it depends totally that what architecture architecture you should use. So uh, that's a very high level of view. I think we will get into specifics, but let's have a round with uh, Ritesh and Pratik. Yeah, Ritesh, what, what do you think about so, front -end? Uh, the meaning of front end architecture has, I mean, changed for me over the years. Like when I was a beginner, I thought that front end architecture is mostly uh, how I structure my repository, uh, the file structure and everything. And today, if you ask me, uh, then I'll say that it's mostly a set of decisions which help you to make sure that your uh, code base is maintainable and scalable. So it can be anything that actually uh, uh, helps you in doing this. Uh, so yeah, that's from me. 
at, at least on a long run, I have learned that folder structure doesn't matter a lot. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Pratik. Right. Uh, what's your okay, so I guess uh, both Ritesh and Ankit have covered uh, uh, most of the points here. Just just to add a few things, as um, as Ankit said, like there are uh, the domains in which websites are built, right? They are vastly different. Uh, I've been uh, lucky enough to be in some of uh, framework related uh, projects, and then there have been like some currently in a fintech related space so the the priorities differ and they basically drive your architecture for example if you were to build if if i were to build a new framework today which i would want uh, to be adopted widely i would rather focus on developer productivity and getting good results by default right that's that's a that's what a lot of web frameworks do uh, whereas if i am uh, starting with a fintech company right with anything related to anyone's money for that sake, right? My top priority would be security. Uh, my decisions would be made on how I'm secure it, uh, securing everyone's data. My uh, decisions would be made on how close my CI would be. And then probably, obviously, like if it's a consumer facing product, I would also focus on performance. But if it's, if it's an internal product per se, uh, a lot of times we focus on the meaning of data. I would not uh, per se focus on first meaningful paint or core web vitals. If my users are already logged in, I would probably focus on a different thing. So it's definitely a choice of tools, as Ritesh said, right? But you have to pick your priority and work backwards from there. Uh, you cannot definitely choose, am I going to do edge rendering Am I go, uh, or am I going to do like a CSR app or something like that and basically build towards your users. It's basically where your end, that's where you start from and build backwards. There are a bunch of ways uh, to do like a different things, right? Uh, you can build your internal apps in a variety of ways. As of now, a bunch of e-commerce uh, shops are being run on very, very different code bases. So that's, that's, I guess that's what front end architecture is for me, uh, picking your priority and picking your tools, which match, uh, the end goal. And yeah, just yep. Yep. going with them. So, uh, going more on the same, uh, point, uh, basically like, uh, uh, you all work on a different, uh, class of application, basically one, um, Pratik, you work on, uh, like more of a exchange uh, app, which is under authenticated. Uh, um, and Ankit works uh, on uh, B2C, uh, not B2C, it is more of like a uh, D2C uh, product, which uh, people can uh, open without login or uh, with login. And right. they just work on a B2B uh, product. So architecture completely differs in all three uh, products, right? Uh, so if you can give a brief uh, about uh, how things are at your organization and uh, like what are the focus point uh, uh, which defines the architecture of your product? Right, uh, maybe I can start with, uh, for this one. So uh, as you said, like uh, in an authenticated exchange, this deals with a lot of crypto, this deals with a lot of money matters uh, our architecture is basically a combination i would say of two different uh two in two different buckets uh, we have a non-signed in experience which is for marketing and sales and your landing pages and search engine optimizations right parts like that which are which are totally built on a different code stack and are published in a different way to optimize delivery to optimize performance and uh, to reduce basically people bouncing off to competition. Once you are in the system, you are signed in and you have a higher rate of engagement and basically you start dealing with data, which is more sensitive. Our first priority is meaningful data and most recent data, given the volatil uh, volatility of the market. Uh, the first focus is the delivery of that data, the faster delivery of data and loading a shell, but not the, that's not the priority anymore. Right. Given that you have already shown a sign of commitment, you're not taking anyone for granted here. Right. Just just to be on record, uh, the user performance or the user is not taken for granted. But uh, your priorities change. Now you would want to see the most recent data and the most meaningful data. 
And that's basically how the architecture is divided into two different things. Uh, we start putting in more GraphQL, more Relay, as soon as you sign in, right? And you need more pieces uh, of the application versus when you are outside, we probably pre-publish pre those pages and keep them on all of our CDNs and every throughout uh, wherever our CDN, CDN coverage is. And those pages are optimized for delivery. And, okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, now I'm working on an SDK, you can say, it's a library. So uh, since businesses use our product, uh, our product is not the whole app. It's just a part of an app, which means that we don't have to worry about this app shell models and uh, time to first paint of that part because that is being taken care of by, uh, by our customers. Now, what we have to worry about is how fast we load our library. Uh, that also depends a lot on the technique that you are using to load the library. Are you loading the library just when needed? Are you able to integrate it in the way that it's uh, supposed to be? So integration becomes a major focus point for SDKs. Like, uh, so when you are deciding about the architecture, you think how easy this architecture is going it to make for the customers to integrate this SDK in their application. So that becomes the first priority. Now the second priority becomes the performance. And since you use WebAssembly, then we have to make sure that that WebAssembly file loads faster. And there's also another product that communicates with the server. So we have to also make sure that, you know, those things, those API uh, responses and everything, so, uh, those things are fast. So as you can see that there's a very big difference between the priorities of, you know, what Pratik said and what I'm saying, and I'm sure Ankit will have a new one. <laughs> yeah, thanks for putting me on a spot, Ritesh. So <laughs> what I want to say is that uh, when you think about front-end architecture, I think most people have like some marquee keywords in their heads that I will use Next.js, I will use re Remix, I will use TypeScript. Now, what I want to say is that these are some conventions over configurations, right? So if you would have used Rails, so it would create your folder structure and it will sort a lot of things without you thinking over it. But that is not what defines your architecture. That is just a hygiene enforcer or some best practices that are tied to you. So for example, let's say I want to build Flipkart or I want to build a Hotstar and my main aim is to show a lot of dynamic content on the page, right? So that is my main use case. That today, if a Marvel movie releases, I want to change the layout completely. Tomorrow, IPL releases, I want to change the, change the layout. Now, if this is your number one requirement, it is not scalable for you to use any of these frameworks and hand code these layouts. You have to think on a different abstraction level. Like how can you arrange these uh, small elements in a Lego kind structure? So that becomes your architecture. So if you see your entire thinking goes from frameworks or anything to these problems. So this is what I I, I have now realized after so many years that uh, your love towards one tool or anything will not take you far. So you have to be in the shoes of your users and think from their perspective. And uh, so this is what uh, you should think when you think in terms of architecture. So these are very gray areas. And I think probably one of the reasons that architects are uh, so hard to get and they charge a bomb. So I've been having a lot of difficult HM conversations with a lot of candidates. So yeah, uh, I think. People do ask about this as well. Like now, uh, Next.js is there and Remix is there, which controls the complete architecture. Then what is the job of architects? What they do? <laughs> so probably uh, you can, your answer uh, answers that. 100%. And, and and I'll tell you, I think I was uh, talking to somebody over architecture and they said that use this new shiny framework and this has the lowest bundle size. And I just did a timeline profile and it was totally red. I said, no matter what you use, but if this is your end result, your architecture choices does not matter because users will not care what new shiny architecture you are using. So browser is still the same. So all of this edge rendering that is happening, but if you're not able to honor the rendering pipeline of the browser. If you still don't uh, care about how many panes, layout thrashing, then I don't see the actual point in doing all of this fancy stuff if we can't just uh, keep track of the basics. Yep, 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 agree. Uh, and 
also like uh, in in any certain application right uh, it's not single architecture which uh, defines the whole uh, application you have a different parts of your application where uh, you have very customized requirement and uh, um, using same uh, maybe state management library or using same uh, pattern might not work uh, so uh, do people have any experience on that where uh, uh, you integrated multiple type of uh, architecture into one uh, piece um, and without creating chaos because generally happens when there are two different way things are done then if you mix them then something is sparks so any experience uh, you probably want to share on that i think you can never prevent chaos there is bound to be some chaos when you are mixing different turns you can just minimize the effect that's it uh i mean one of the things i think most people do here is when when they are migrating their uh, i mean website from some a design to b uh, they prefer doing it first on mobile or desktop and then redirect you to the old one on one platform now it doesn't have to do anything with your internal architecture but eventually the whole architecture is you know around that concept that when the request comes i, I have to serve this and from mobile and then from desktop i have to serve this now no matter no matter how much you try there there is chaos there uh, and uh, i believe that if you are going to mix things there will be some of that always oh uh, i i'd like to like add a small point there just in continuity to what rite uh, ritesh said um i worked on uh, an application uh, which was an, a, one of the large internal uh, applications which was using micro front end and then we were at some at one point in time in experience we had to handhold the users to move to an another exp uh, another experience which was not micro front end and was built on totally different architecture and then they have to come back the one of the things that helped us the most was keeping the two pieces stateless like web as as historically was built to be as stateless as possible http is stateless right um in a in a multi page app this this would have been a no brainer right you move from one page to another you you take it for granted that everything is stateless and you have to have your solutions around that right uh if if in a world of single page apps we we don't we don't take care of that anymore and we don't have to take care of that anymore because it's a single page it's just we for vanity sake we change urls and for accessibility uh, sake we change urls and show different content but if you are working with two different architectures if you can keep the transition between those two architectures as stateless as possible for your users and for your uh, two applications that could basically minimize the chaos as uh, as much as possible as as rite said it won't there are very exceptionally rare cases where it will be zero right uh, but if you can keep the transition between the two architectures uh, stateless for the baseline that would be a good starting point there are a bunch of other things that you can do to keep it uh, sane but this definitely should be your baseline yep and i think on the topic of migrations once you start a migration i think you should uh, make sure that your migration actually finishes otherwise you will just have lots of pieces on your pages and as pratik was saying so Uh, Ritesh was saying that you have multiple things on on the same page. Uh, you have uh, because all these frameworks, right? They guarantee you that they, you don't have to replace your entire app. You can start small, but the frameworks are not small. So you can start small, but the frameworks will come in entirety. And and if you are uh, doing page by page, so you have to make sure that all of these pages. So right now, all of your transitions might be client side transitions. You are not doing a server side refresh. but if you are say going from page a to page b and page b is on a different server you have to make sure all of your transitions are hard transitions and that itself is a very hard problem uh because in in if you are in an app which has like thousands and lakhs of pages like an e-commerce website it's very difficult to make sure that you account for this and more more often than not we think about this rollout strategy only at the end so you will think all about which frameworks and what folder structure to use but how do you actually roll out this to users i think this is where most of the people 
uh, do not think and that's where architecture like really shines up like are you even clear how will you ship this or sell these uh, uh, things out when the time comes So there's a meme, right? Where, wherein one person is sitting on the bus, it's very rosy, and uh, the other one, it's very sad. So it is like while writing a new product, while rolling this out. So uh, you can relate with that. Yeah, and I, I remember, like, um, so in my last organization, we were migrating from Backbone to React, and uh, uh, there was a point where we had to, uh, uh, we, where we were opening the same page. on backbone version and the react version just to do like ab testing on that uh, uh, and to support that we had to do like a lot of uh, nginx uh, uh, thing some like uh, cookie thing that that was a fun um i, I would like to um, go more toward uh, this patterns only like um, so th- there are small patterns like uh, pratik uh, mentioned that uh, having a stateless uh, portion uh, let's you keep things sane uh, for a long term what are different other patterns uh, which uh, you people have uh, felt that uh, uh, those are some some of the basic core concept if you follow that um, your architecture will grow uh, grow fine and it will scale well uh, maybe ankit we can start uh, with you no i think i just listen to this other sound <laughs> <laughs> I mean uh sorry but the question is not clear to me can you please uh, reword it so uh, there are certain core uh, engineering principles and uh, this core engineering principles like uh, keeping things uh, uh, stateless or uh, um, isolating like have uh, um, isolating the responsibility uh, to certain pieces or you could have uh, more of like a single source of truth type of thing Got so it. ha uh-huh. if you can give some example which uh, where this principles help you to scale uh, your architecture uh this is yeah i think this conversation is going towards uh, micro front ends uh, where you actually divide your application into smaller parts so that you can actually maintain it well uh so uh i have used that in the past uh, but uh, not when the i mean long before the word micro front end was popular uh, it was just micro services then uh, <laughs> and uh, i think uh, one of the biggest part i mean when you are creating anything where you have different parts having different architecture uh, one of the import- most important thing is planning like for uh, for example you said that when you were migrating from uh, one framework to another uh, and last we talked about chaos uh, there will be chaos but how you manage that like for example last year we migrated from typescript to flow the whole uh, and if it was that's interesting because people it's the other way reverse sorry sorry <laughs> i said the reverse we migrated from flow to typescript uh, you were in the flow. and uh, yeah i was in the flow sorry <laughs> <laughs> now see the thing is now since we don't actually have a micro front end for a sdk a lot of times it doesn't make sense for a sdk uh, so uh, the thing is that we had to actually migrate the whole code base uh, from a to b and it's not easy unless you are planning it well so there was a bit of chaos for one week but we planned it in a way that it didn't affect anyone's work now if it was a micro front end or different you know small applications then it would have been much easier to actually migrate one part at a time and then you know move to the another one so i think these techniques might be helpful if you are trying to create a front end architecture where you want to follow different patterns because all those micro front ends can follow different architectures even different frameworks or one can use typescript one can use flow it doesn't matter as long as the public api of that micro front end or what it does remains the same so uh that really helps if you t- want to mix uh, different uh, architecture patterns but if you mix right. it in the same uh, same front end architecture then i don't think it's a good idea so i know sudhanshu here is uh, the one who asked these questions but i want to know like micro front ends how do you make 
make them work with faster page loads because let's say you are using two big frameworks and the same section how do you still make your page load fast because the frameworks will still download in complete in its entirety right so what right, is yeah. that thing that people use or they don't use can i stuff? can this i a- like uh, just before we like totally delve deep down into micro front ends can i just take a step back and answer sudanshu's uh, prior question right so obviously like we've talked about micro front ends but uh, there's another lens uh, of how do we keep our architecture scalable right is basically uh, we have been looking for quite some time like uh, in my previous role previous to previous i would say uh, for contributing to a bunch of open source uh, open source frameworks we definitely took a look at how the biggest organizations on the planet keep their architecture scalable keep their application scalable and basically have a gazillion employees working and without just just lighting it up right um so one of the biggest things uh, as you said like few principles of single source of truth and uh, keeping the best practices up in the front is definitely helpful however there were uh, there were a few other things and the biggest contributor to that was was basically guardrails right if you have a sound uh, if you have a sound architecture if you have a sound setup for your front end right there will be instances where uh, folks will be introducing anti practices there will be folks that are use that are holding it upside down and still making it work right one of the things that uh, you should invest as soon as the application go- grows beside the threshold and as soon as application grows beyond that threshold start investing into guardrails like how do we how do we actively stop mm-hmm. uh developers at the very authoring time right to to basically write anti uh basically stop from stop them from writing anti uh sorry bad practices or holding the whole thing upside down right uh basically so, you can talk about end user metrics or your architecture no, no i'm i am talking about keeping the architectural scalable and ensuring that your developers uh don't misuse or uh basically don't bring in things which are not supposed to be right you can very well bring in for it's a oversimplified example but let me still put it out there there is nothing stopping you to uh include jquery in your react application where it's pretty known uh, it's like everybody would just say that uh you know it's it's not required right other than from some th- if it's coming from some third party right so how do you stop your developers from basically doing this uh it can be as simple as lint rules it can be a bit more complex as is something sitting in your compiler and looking at not only your first party code but a lot of your third party code as well okay auditing processes right how do you make ensure that whatever npm modules randomly your developers are installing are good to go with your uh, architecture and does not exactly what ankit was saying does not download a 100 mb framework just on fly right uh, so this is something that a lot of uh, major companies invest in and it definitely helps whatever is your state of the art the current state of the art it helps it keep in a sane shape right because it basically uh like prevents any developers from abusing it so i think on the same line right i think we once did what we did was that we i think people chunk out these codes right uh, so you mm-hmm. chunk out into vendor bundle what we did was we created different like buckets for node modules anything related to react goes into one anything related to let's say lodash goes into one so we had five buckets any time a new bucket gets created we used to fail the pipeline you're right. gone you right exactly that's a you can't yeah, yeah so that's that's another example of how you can basically start preparing what should not happen and start investing into tools which can stop that right and as i said it, it can be as simple as just lint rules yeah. right yeah. or something as complex as was ankit is saying No, mine was I. I took it some. I googled it and found how to split your node modules. Okay. So, 
I'm saying you don't have to know everything like the back of your hand, but you should have okay. your Uber goals clear that I want to do this, and then yeah. you will figure it out how how it needs to be done. So, yeah. Yeah. and uh, on the same point, uh, basically any. Other examples, or more uh, in a terms of like a. No, I think my uh, question uh, for page load is still remaining. Who is answering right. that? I okay. I can take that one as well. <laughs> Sorry, and I let uh, Ritesh or Sudanshu add to it. So, what the concern of loading multiple frontends is definitely valid, right? However, micro frontends is more towards a pros an organizational concept where hey, your products you can ship on your own speed you can build on your own ci you can use your own setup right and still ship with the rest of the application but i don't think it's necessarily uh, two different frameworks when it comes to two different micro frontends it can very well be that hey the product page team sorry we just have a lot of rules in flipkart so, <laughs> so a product page team is uh, is its own mm -hmm. owner it has its own ci setup has its own uh, process and pipelines and can very well work with uh, a product listing or or a discovery team, right? Which basically how you reach to that product page. Uh, how, how you stop that we are not shipping to like if we are if you're shipping to frameworks, that's also I guess like I, it wouldn't be by mistake. The two teams couldn't be writing Angular and React by mistake. Uh, someday it yeah. would be a more thought out call. Uh, call I hope, right? But yes, there's no stopping in by design. Micro frontends doesn't stop something like that. But also, they were, I, I personally feel like, and everywhere that I've seen and worked with micro frontends, they were to solve an organizational problem, to give different paces to different team and entire autonomy and stuff. They weren't really solving a technical problem. They were solving more of an organizational problem. Yeah. Uh, and, okay. So, yeah. I, I, I can add to it. So. As Pratik said, that it allows you to do that, but you can't always do it. Like uh, web components actually always says that we are a perfect fit for micro frontends uh, because then whichever uh, framework you are using, we are there to help you out. Uh, so that's that's one of the use cases they actually promote for themselves. So that is possible. But then also there's a thinking like why will you use react in one micro front end then angular in another then view in the third one uh it's mostly to speed you up so i don't think this is actually going to speed you up at least in an organization uh, and what if you use different versions of react <laughs> and um i i think what pratik mentioned right uh, this is more of an organization problem and probably i think uh, micro front end, uh, there is a clear separation between two pieces of your product where like, let's say one user doesn't go on a flow uh, and that flow is uh, defined with a different uh, framework or something, then it doesn't right. matter whether uh, it's on a different library or uh, yeah. uh, it's the same library. Though like uh, I'm completely in uh, aligned with uh, that having one uh, library, at least uh, on such level where uh, React versus Angular, it makes sense to have just one. Uh, having too many different things, it uh, it kind of slow down uh, in uh, every aspect. So, like you can't have a common piece um, uh, of a code, and you can't share things much easier. Yeah, yeah. In the most yeah, uh, we... performant micro frontend, sorry, uh, just just to complete my thought. In the most performant uh, micro frontend uh, products that I have worked with, you don't get to choose your tools, right? The tools are definitely singular and uh, like they are common for every micro frontend. You choose, you get to choose your autonomy. You get to choose your own velocity and your own deployments, right? If you if you want to dip, if you are a very critical piece and you want to deploy after regressive testing, deploy only once after a week. Everything that is in master will not go to production every evening. Versus if there's a team who is very comfortable shipping every evening, then they should be able to do that. But like, as I said, for the most performance ones that I have worked with, the tools were not a choice. The autonomy was. Yep. yep. Right. And uh, I have a similar experience. Like, uh, uh, the micro front end mostly governs the uh, deployment cycle um, that uh, different people can deploy differently. There is a different product have a different uh, uh, threshold of uh, error, uh, you can say, uh, where if you break uh, on one product, uh, 
it might be fine but if you break the same thing on the other product it might not be fine so having that autonomous uh, is very helpful although i'm thankful i yeah, don't have the front end experience <laughs> <laughs> i think we can actually simplify micro front ends into plugins they are just you know different parts of your application that come together and make it work uh when you think of them like plugins then you can actually relate to okay i use babel it has different plugins why are they there why are why is it not a single bundle which we actually ship so it just makes testing easier maintaining it easier uh and organizing and everything easier it doesn't necessarily have to you know be written in a different language it just makes uh other things easier so actually i like this analogy like uh, if we consider it as a plugin then uh then all is good <laughs> but coming yeah. with a good plugin system is equally hard yeah yeah cool do we have any questions from audience are they even interested in what we are saying or they have something totally different in their heads um i'll let quickly sudhanshu scramble i i can't see comments so Maybe if think... Kiran is looking at comments or something. But um, I I have uh, one question on more of like a uh, some of the bad experience you people have uh, uh, because of uh, some bad architecture um, and why it was a, like a bad experience. If you can give any, uh, I know like uh, it might be. <laughs> uh, uh, Sudhanshu, so uh, just uh, I'm I'm looking at comments and there is. one uh question that probably not sure if you can take a look at okay so i think somebody is asking what trends do you consider to look forward for front end architecture in future say for example web3 and http3 so these are totally different uh, <laughs> and, yeah uh, sure. i mean so Even no comments you about web three architecture. You should use HTTP three, so uh, you don't have to change your architecture for that, right? Yeah. Uh, and web three, I have very little. I have just lost my money in web three. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and anyone so here I, have experience on web three? I have a remote experience with web three. right i'm not actively contributing uh, to any product which is directly related to web3 but from uh, from all the re remote knowledge web3 is uh, the impact of web3 into front end technologies is or a major idea for front end or how browsers work or how delivery works is yet to be explored right there are a few ideas there are a few um proposals on few things that we can do differently right but none of them are uh, ground breaking as in like they will change the way how we render on or how we basically build or how we deploy or how we deliver so that's one thing uh but i guess one of the trends that i am looking forward is for the edge rendering to solve a bunch of problems at hand right for example few of the things is uh, delivery right if we can deliver only the piece to the users which which they require and not a bunch of if else condition which go to the client and then decide that hey is this user supposed to execute a code or not and skip that part this is one thing and the, like this can be translated into a better ab testing infrastructure for client side apps right we don't have to bundle literally every permutation combination to all the users or all the experiments to all the users if if at uh, at my edge if i have enough user context and can potentially just deliver the minimum required bundle to them that would itself be a good uh, starting point right i i have one question there uh, on the edge rendering part uh, uh, is it first is it ready yet uh, second uh, basically most of the edge rendering comes with uh, having stateless uh servers which doesn't have much context and uh, which does very minimal thing uh, right. but uh, a product uh, uh, when you have a session uh, you have a lot of context uh, uh, here and there um 
is edge rendering uh, good to solve that? I wish friends from Cloudflare were here <laughs> to answer yeah. that better. Uh, but yeah, anyone? Hard pass. I mean, <laughs> I haven't actually uh, come across examples where you have dynamic data uh, and then you uh, you are using edge rendering there. Uh, most of the examples I have seen have been about you know static content uh, being served from CDNs. Mostly, right. I mean, for analogy, I treat it as uh, as a service worker where you have something saved and uh, it just del gets delivered to you quickly. And if something is not cached, uh, then you call the server and pick the latest one. So, uh, and talking about that, you know, Web3, and of course, I know edge computing is totally different, two different worlds. Uh, so... Web3, whatever I have seen, most of the use cases so far have been theoretical and we haven't actually proven that, you know, they will actually add value in uh, real world. Uh, and that might happen, but so far, most of the use cases have been theoretical. Um, now, talking about HTTP3, I guess this is the next version of HTTP2. I was very disappointed with HTTP2, actually. Uh, everyone thought that it will by default make everything fast and it didn't actually happen. You won't see HTTP2. If you, if you are talking about performance, it might come up, but if anyone has actually used it, you will realize that no, it doesn't actually always improve the speed. We implemented it in housing and we realized that it's actually making our website slower than before. Mm -hmm. That's true. So there is one question, and actually, like uh, it's an important one. Uh, when we are creating, uh, when we are deciding an architecture for an MVP, um, maybe on a startup, uh, what are the considerations uh, we should do? Because uh, uh, an MVP product and uh, like a full fledged, uh, which is already running from uh, many years, uh, that's completely different. Uh, uh, and what steps probably we should take uh, while thinking uh, how, how we should future proof uh, whatever architecture we are deciding on the first end? So then it actually depends also, right? That what is your MVP? So let's say you are building an app, uh, real estate app, right? Where you want to find homes for rent. Now, you would not go there always and routinely. So your app needs to be optimized for first page loads, not for subsequent loads. So there you can go ahead and do uh, some fancy. You don't have to optimize for blocking calls. Uh, sorry, you don't have to optimize for subsequent calls. So so then your guardrails and exit right here is totally different. But whether if you're using, you're creating an app like Instagram, wherein people would come even if your page load time is high uh, because they don't have anything to do while sitting or uh, wherever you are uh, scrolling. So then you have a different problem statement that your app should run without any memory leaks and it shouldn't crash. So if so we just create are... a new domain of doom scrolling. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so these are very difficult uh, things to answer, like right off the bat, if you just say an MVP and I think with an MVP, you have, uh, you would think that you would have a lot of freedom, but then the time, uh, the, the, the moment you say MVP, that means that you have a deadline and you have to ship out that MVP. So, so that plays a very critical role. Yeah. And instead of doing a, a, what do you say, decision log of all the frameworks, everything, you would just go to whatever you are comfortable with. And I've seen this happen a lot more. So there can be hundred things out in the world which are right, but you will still go and watch friends. So, so, so that is what I have seen. And it is practical. Uh, but nothing against it. Yeah. But so I guess this, this is, we are definitely going to our first question, back to our first question a little bit. But for our MVP, yes, exactly as Ankit said, like do what is, uh, what you are most comfortable because for an MVP, iteration is the key and not really performance or not really anything else or, or layout thrashing on how, or browser performance or anything, right? You, you want to quickly build something uh, and... I'm not sure who the stakeholders are in this case, but present it to them, right? So if whatever uh, somebody is comfortable in is should be their first uh, preference because the key is iteration. And you want to build that yeah. thing probably faster than others. Yeah. And, I, and I most of the times, 
uh, most of the yeah. times the point to prove with an mvp is that the product works not that you know right. uh, uh, micro front ends or uh, you know some uh, you know state management library so you just have to do it quickly and make sure you don't invest extra time or waste your time because M- mvps can fail whatever time you wasted in you know thinking a lot about those micro front ends and all will be a wastage if it if it didn't work yeah and um uh, i have a similar need a lot of code i mean as as much as you can right because see you can't always learn from the mistakes that you have made so you should read out a lot of code even if it has bad code whatever code that you get and see did that make difference to the product that it was written in so will that help my situation or not because if you just try and learn to whatever you are doing i don't think it will scale so uh, that has been my go to thing so if if somebody puts out something there i always make it a point and go and read this out and see does it apply to my context can this apply to my context in future and that's how you keep your mental notes uh, and if this situation comes you have some points that you can at least talk it out in the meeting um what i was saying like um, i have a similar opinion and uh, basically the best architecture is which organic organically grows based on the requirement uh, you can never be right on the first hand and we shouldn't be like uh, we shouldn't be right on the first hand because uh, the requirement changes a lot for mvp versus a product which is uh, scaled uh, to like millions of user so the whole requirement is different so the architecture would be different so rewriting is fine um and i have seen like a, a maximum company do a lot of rewrite uh, on architecture level and we, which is fine because uh, uh, depending on when uh, something was required uh, it served the purpose cool i think whenever uh, somebody says that you need to rewrite so you should take a step back also uh, because rewrites are fancy everybody wants to rewrite uh, somebody else's code uh, without <laughs> thinking right. that what the other person did so i have also done that that my code is best uh, the other codes not so much it has but, a cost to it which is yeah. usually ends up being much higher than what you expected right. so uh, i think you should also go down and not just see from requirements perspective you might have like five requirements but if you see in the code you would have uh, somebody else would have 150 conditions so you need to also see so that you don't lose out and you are not recreating whatever was in the past so you should have that strategy as well up front before you even start rewriting it so yeah, yeah. um not sure how much time we have left but uh, we can take there are two more questions from uh, people uh, one is basically um, can you share any insight on e-commerce architecture for high scale uh so probably ankit we can uh, go with you on this one uh you have worked with flipkart and now disney i think the architecture is extremely complex it's not uh, i don't think i can do justice to it in 4 uh, or 5 minutes but i think you should uh, for e-commerce right i think uh, you have two three pages and focus more on performance and see how less you can do uh, there are lots of frameworks now that have e-commerce starter kits and all uh, but i think you should have a real strategy on how do you do your widgets and layouting so performance you would nail it down but in the long run whatever are your frequent operations uh, that i think you should have in mind overall user metric you should have a good grasp on metrics what metrics to track so uh, let's say amazon people will go to amazon even if it's not on first load right but they they might get they might not make that buy decision if the click on the buy button takes 7 seconds to load the next page or widget so i'm not sure uh, whether there is a, a way where we can surface out these metrics because i always see lighthouse scores 100 i mean they don't tell even 80% of the story it's just the first load what did the user do after that uh, how can we map that journey from home to checkout so uh, that is that i feel is very difficult to solve uh, and uh, and um, uh, uh, because you came to this point uh, sorry uh, ritas uh, so i have a question on like most of the time people focus on the first payload or like uh, uh, fmp or ttl uh, but what might matter is real 
uh, like what user perceive um, any any uh, experience uh, to all of you uh, where uh, you have improved for uh, user uh, pursued experience and not just the like uh, metrics um, and uh, is there any way uh, you people have tracked uh, those pursued experience yeah so can I, you can you some re like repeat that I so, so I think what Sudhanshu is saying that instead of showing your hundred green scores of lighthouse, right? Was there a way that you uh, solved the, uh, let's say, jank or uh, how much time does it take in between navigations or uh, render optimize performance optimization? So I think I, I would like to give a small example. So in laptops, people have M1 Max. It doesn't really matter like if your performance is bad or if you're doing a lot of painting, your component is re-rendering. But if you switch, so at Hotstar, we have a lot of apps on uh, smart TVs. So Samsung, LG, these have web-based apps. But their performance is like one-tenth of your laptop. So if things are working fine on your laptop, on TV, if you try and navigate, uh, it will uh, it'll not be that fast. So I think uh, if you have that use case, you should go and uh, optimize that. You profile and set up some journeys i think lighthouse now supports journeys where you can transition to pages and record the times and emit lots of custom metrics uh, so yeah, not hogging all uh, the time i think if if you want to chase one metric the most important one will be time to first meaningful paint it's not time to first paint or anything else time to first uh, meaningful paint and the second will be time to interactivity if you get these, uh, I mean, under control, then I think users will have a good experience. Another thing is you should actually see the screenshot, like how after how long you feel that, OK, my site is usable. There's no alternate right. to that. Uh, just just to add to that, like both of these metrics have a real user metrics companions now as largest contentful paint and uh, INP, which is a bit experimental but interaction to next paint. Now these are more focused from the user's point of view instead of developer's point of view. So you might get a bit more realistic and field view data. Uh, but yes, like both of these are uh, pretty spot on user experience metrics. Yep. Cool. Cool. Uh, so one question, uh, and this is uh, to all from the beginners that uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, Twitter development, tw Twitter driven development happening across all the organization. Uh, and uh, at, it also leads to people just knowing one uh, framework which uh, they saw on a Twitter and they just tried it out. They try to implement the same uh, thing on their organization. Um, how do, actually I diverted from the question which uh, uh, People ask, but uh, yeah, uh, like uh, how to prevent uh, from that uh, de driven development thing? How to not uh, fall into that trap? Um, I'll go for this. So I think there was a time when we actually complained that there's a lot of Twitter driven development, but uh, I don't think we can complain about that anymore. Uh, I think the content on Twitter is not a lot about use this, use that. Uh, right now, it used to be a bit different uh, two years or three years ago. Now, uh, I mean, I can see the actual, I think it's the question is like most beginners know one framework. I think is this, uh, is that question? No, no. Uh, I, mean, I started with that, but I got diverted. So I will ask you that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fine. So I feel that, you know, nobody can actually convince you to not try the things that you don't actually need. Uh, you can just accept that there will be n number of things and the list of things you don't know will always be greater than the list of things you know. So just accept that. Don't try to chase it every time. Um, I mean, I don't know GraphQL. I haven't used GraphQL. Uh, I mean, even after so many years. And I've been mm -hmm. saying this every year because I've never needed it. I once tried to forcefully use it in a invoicing platform I was making, but I realized that I'm just wasting my time. Uh, it's not needed. So I think it's on you. You have to accept that you can't know everything. Yeah. Or maybe you can be a bit smart about it, that you can categorize frameworks uh, 
let's say frameworks which have virtual dom right you you try one of that then there are frameworks which do not have virtual dom you try one of that and then it would allow you to think and expand your brain that this is not the only way that things can work so so maybe you have react you you try something for reactivity also like solid js or let's say swell you don't have to try everything so uh, yeah yeah keep your to do that's a good ready. idea actually yeah yeah and i yeah, think thanks. that that answer uh, that question as well uh, where uh, the question was uh, uh, beginners mostly know one framework how they can improve no, no, beginners uh, know more than us i think uh, i have seen some of their so not on twitter but i've uh, i've i see i've seen their github profiles and uh, uh, when you go into hiring calls right i see a lot of talent now uh, it might not be on twitter but uh, but i see a lot of new things that the beginners are doing and so it it is not generalized but yeah you need not know everything to be a good engineer i think if you can think on exactly. your feet if think long term i mean uh, people knew only jquery back then and and they are superstars so i i was sitting on that very idea that knowing one framework can still take you a very very long way yes and you, as you, you know proceed in your career yeah exactly and as you proceed in your career there will be like at least for a beginner there is a good long way that you will be given uh, an opportunity to work with different things where you won't really have a call that we should work this or work on this or work on uh, that so uh, just knowing one thing uh, for at least for some time wouldn't be the worst thing possible right just don't can... be a user of a framework that's it so i think don't there was a the... called paul irish uh, he uh, did a video that 10 things he learned by reading the source of jquery so just not be a user and even if you know just one try to just go deeper in that and think that if this is happening how it would be done and reverse engineer yeah i think for a beginner the focus should be to learn one thing well rather than learning a lot of things uh, i mean this i mean you are a beginner so it means that it's expected from you that you won't know everything so i don't know i mean what the problem is it shouldn't be a problem that's okay right exactly yeah yeah and uh, most of time it's just like uh, a feeling that uh, uh, which we think uh, whatever we know is not good enough uh, it's just it's just the feeling it's nothing like uh, we, people don't know anything and it, basically no, speaking so to to whatever we know will never be enough so whatever you know there will always be so much to learn i mean it has nothing to do with being a beginner yeah even yeah. after 10 years you'll feel the same no yes. matter how much you know so this panel you can just can't you have to accept it and live with it yeah seems like this panel became more of like a thought <laughs> not leadership motivation yeah, this is where, this is where we end the panel then yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah enough gyan for the people thanks everyone uh, okay. Thank i think you. we are on time as well Bye bye